Welcome everyone to our next talk as part of CPO Mastery Conference. We are thrilled to be joined by Julie Zhou, one of the foremost experts in the product design space. Julie is the co-founder of Sundial, which is a platform that enables builders to make meaningful use of their data to fulfill their mission. Prior to this, she was a VP of product design at Facebook, where she helped scale the service from 8 million to over billions of users. Julie is also the author of The Making of a Manager, which is a Amazon bestseller and a must read for any person who is about to become a new manager. In our talk today, Julie, if Julie will focus on PM skills to do master. Julie, I'll have you take it away. Thank you so much, Mo. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to virtually feel your presence today. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, how I think about product leadership and, um, you know, as the title states, the many facets of it. And I want to take you to actually starting with one diagram um, from a book that I really love. Now, this book is called No Hard Feelings, and it is a, a wonderful uh, book about basically emotions in the workplace by Liz and Molly. And Liz and Molly, I feel a very special bond to because both of our books came out on the exact same day. This was about two years ago uh, in 2019. So we published on the very same day, and I've always been a huge fan. So their book is filled with lots of wonderful, amazing diagrams, many of which you probably have seen all around the internet. Um, but this one in particular struck me um, because it, you know, as you can see, it, it says what I thought would make me productive, which is hard work, and what actually does, which is a combination of hard work, time off, sleep, healthy eating, and exercise. And I've, I've loved this, you know, the simplicity of, of, you know, what this conveys. And I've actually tried to apply it to lots of other parts. You know, for me, for example, what I thought being a great design leader was and what it actually was. And in this case, what I thought being a great product leader was and what it actually was. So here's basically my version. <laughs> so when I, when I was just getting started in building products, what I thought would make me a great product leader was, you know, I kind of thought it was all about actually having a great product vision, you know, having a clear sense of what is a great idea for a product that people would love. And then, you know, just, just kind of going off of there. Like if you come up with something brilliant, then the users will come. And now having been in this, uh, you know, role in design and product for, you know, a decade and a half, I've realized that actually what it is, um, is, you know, the biggest chunk is ownership and execution, followed by skill translation, data fluency, a good process, and having a great product vision is, you know, still there, but it's a much smaller chunk. And I wanted to just take you all through, okay, what does this mean? What are these different slices of the pie? How do you kind of think about them? And I want to talk with, of course, starting with the biggest one, which is ownership and execution. So what do I mean by that? So there's a story that I really love uh, about Steve Jobs. And reportedly, you know, if you became a VP at Apple, uh, Steve would take you aside and he would, you know, kind of have a one-on-one -on -one with you and he would tell you a story. And the story he would tell would, would be along the lines of, you know, he would say, hello, you know, congratulations for being a VP. And, you know, I, one of the things that happens at Apple is that of course, you know, in, our, in the course of our jobs, we run into problems. And he'll tell you the story about, perhaps one day if he came to his office and he realized that it hadn't been cleaned you know that's a problem right you know he expects that the office would be cleaned every morning if it's not you know what do you do and so his natural inclination would be like well i should talk to the janitor it's the janitor's job to clean the office every day and maybe the janitor will say something like oh mr jobs you know i would have cleaned your office but unfortunately the, do the door to your office was locked and i didn't have the key and that would be the reason he'd give for why the office wasn't clean and Steve would say, okay, if that were the reason the janitor gave me, no problem. You know, like I would accept that. It's not his fault. You know, we should figure out why the, the door was locked and so forth. But he says, at a certain level, as you advance through the company, you eventually reach the point where the reason stopped mattering. And uh, at a certain point, you know, it doesn't even matter. Like, was the door locked? Was it not? Like, if you had a job to do, you have to, you, you, you know, you were meant to do it. And he said, and that level is now where you are, you know, which is to, to what he would say to the VP. And I think about this a lot because I think it's one of the best uh, ways to kind of demonstrate what ownership is, which is the idea that if there is a problem, you will figure out how to solve it. 
and whatever it takes, you know, um, uh, and, and you will, if the issue is a door is locked, you would go and, and pursue why is the door locked? Who did it? How can we improve the process? How do we make sure this doesn't happen in the future in order to get to that final outcome, which is that this doesn't, you know, the, the, thing, the goals that we said or the things that we want to happen, happen. And that is what is meant by ownership. And Ownership, I think, is hugely important for PMs and product leaders, even more so than than other roles, because it's the that role I think of as kind of the glue, right? You know, as a product leader, you are being given a goal um, or to reach a particular outcome, and you have at your disposal, you know, all of the other teams that come together to make that happen. Whether it's engineers, it's designers, uh, data scientists, researchers, and so forth. But you're also there to try and understand, okay, if something isn't working. Why is that? And what do we need to do to, to get it to work better? If, if, if two team members are not able to, uh, you know, hit their, their milestones, like, why is that? You know, is it a communication issue? Is it a people issue? Let's figure out what the, the issue is and let's, let's resolve it. And so I think one of the most important qualities when it comes to product leadership is this attribute of you own it, you know, and you own it even if you aren't asked to own it, because that is how you end up growing and advancing in your career. Um, The second thing I think about too, is that, you know, in order to be successful as an owner, um, you kind of also have to understand the context, right? And let's say you're the product manager, your job is to oversee this particular feature, you want this feature to, 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 you know, grow, grow. But it's not sufficient to just even understand your feature and be the expert. You have to understand how does this feature fit in into the larger context of your product, which in turn, you have to understand how does this product fit into the larger context of our business? Uh, Because, you know, at the end of the day, people come together to be able to build wonderful things, but things, things have to also be sustainable from a business perspective, which means you have to understand how does your company make money? How does your project contribute to the top level goals? And ultimately, what are the things that keep your CEO uh, up at night? The more that you are able to grow in your path of just not just understanding your domain or your feature or your area, but start to ask, what does my boss care about? What does my boss's boss care about? What does my boss's boss's boss care about all the way to the CEO? That is what gives you the ability to then act like an owner and have the context to be able to uh, own your problems and own uh, what it is that you are being tasked to do. I want to wrap it up by saying that, you know, at the end of the day, if you have, you know, you you have an owner's mindset and you understand the context of the business, the last ingredient is to be excellent at execution. And what I think execution means is simply the ability to get things done, right? If there is a goal, if there is a task, how good are you at, at helping, enabling, not just yourself personally, because maybe you're an excellent personal executor, but how good are you at enabling execution among your teams? You know, making sure that your design team, your, your uh, engineering team, your data scientists, researchers, everyone that makes up your team has what they need to be able to do their great work and come together in harmony towards us being able to achieve our goal. Execution is often, you know, it's not the, uh, it's not as, as perhaps uh, noteworthy or as buzzy as strategy or, you know, kind of like, ooh, like knowing the vision of all this stuff. But when it comes to what makes for successful product management, being able to say that you're gonna be able to do something and doing it on time reliably is one of the most important uh, gifts. It's one of the most important attributes that you can have as a product leader. Okay, next up um, I have skill translation. So what does that mean? And I think about it uh, like this, you know, when you're on a product team, Naturally, you want people to come together who have a diversity of skill sets, right? You have designers who are wonderful at thinking about user experience and and potentially, you know, dreaming about what the product vision could be. You have engineers who obviously are really great at um, uh, implementing and and making technical decisions, focusing on optimization. But each function has its own kind of language. Each function has its own way of talking about their work and what it means to do great work. And as a product manager, you know, you have your own language, right? The language of PMs is often the language of metrics and KPIs and goals and so forth. I think it's very important to keep in mind that in the scope of being a product leader, one important 
uh, goal, one important attribute that you have to have is you have to in some ways be a translator. You have to be able to take, you know, maybe the language that you know, um, which, uh, you know, maybe uh, uh, some examples of like getting the wow to 2x and talk about it in a way that is actually inspiring and makes sense to somebody who doesn't speak that same language, right? So I could tell you right now, if you tell a designer, get wow to 2x, that is not a motivating way to talk about the work. That is not inspirational. That does not make them like want to get up and like do great work, right? Instead, yeah, I think, you, you know, if you were, again, speaking to a designer, you have to help them explain, okay, why is this great for users? Or what is this going to enable that makes the user experience better, right? Um, and that often means going one step deeper and saying, okay, well, why, you know, if we want, if we have weekly active users, what do we think, we, what value can we put in our product that makes them more likely to want to come back, maybe twice as often or deepen their engagement or so forth? And, and that's the question that you would maybe give as a design brief to somebody who is going to go and work on the design, right? Similarly, designers may come to you and they say, oh, we need to make the page breathe better. And that doesn't translate that well to an engineer. It's like, why do we need to make the you know page breathe better? And and uh, so, so uh, it, as a as your role as a PM, you know, being able to speak all of the different languages and being able to act as an effective translator helps the team be aligned on what's important and to be able to then move as a unified group uh, uh, across understanding why the priorities are what they are and why we should focus on on certain important initiatives. Um, so one way to think about your job is it's not just, you know, you've got your own language, it's the way that other uh, PMs talk, but make sure that you go and you truly understand what helps motivate, um, what uh, helps make understandable things to uh, people of different disciplines and be an effective translator in that respect. That's how you get to greater alignment. Uh, examples would be making the page breathe better. You can say, let's make this page easier for someone to visually scan and process so that they can consume the information quickly. Let's do a rev on the strategy. What does that mean? Let's put together a clear six month plan that focuses on deepening the value that this particular audience gets from our product. You know, these were, this is like the core of what is meant by these phrases and being able to say them in a way that everyone understands um, is an effective way to drive alignment. Next up, I wanna talk a little bit about data fluency. So what do I mean by that? I'm a big believer of this phrase that what we're trying to do essentially with product development, especially product development that uh, is around, um, you know, growing and amplifying and making something more valuable is that we're essentially diagnosing where the problems and opportunities are with data and we're trying to treat with design. Um, and so what data can tell you is just how customers respond to a product idea or to the, the way that they actually incorporate their product, uh, your product in their day-to-day, -day, right? It helps you understand, you know, what they're thinking, what they're doing, and what they're feeling. And when I say data, I mean it in a very broad sense. I think data, you know, if you go and talk to 10 customers and they tell you what their problems are and what they need, that's data, right? Because you're, you're understanding some external phenomenon that will then help you make better decisions. And similarly, if you go and look at dashboards, uh, you know, and you, you track WoW, you track active users, you track downloads, that's also data because it gives you, again, additional insight into the, your customers' actions and behaviors. But, you know, and what data is really, really good at is it helps you spot where are the problem points, where are the opportunities, you know, where are there um, are potentially also problems. And so your ability to be able to, uh, you know, read the data and leverage the data and draw insights from the data will directly correlate with your ability to come up with the right plans and the right strategies. Um, but that said, data doesn't solve the problem, right? I don't usually like the word, let's be data driven, because that implies that, you know, data will, will, will tell you exactly what you need to do. And that's not the case. Data, like all things, is uh, facts that you then have to apply a level of interpretation on. And there are ways to interpret data well, and there's ways to interpret data poorly. And we're also in this uh, interesting time period where now, because so many of us work in software, everything is measurable. And, you know, we're logging everything, we're logging pretty much everything that people do on our sites, on our services. So we have no shortage of, you know, actual data that's being tracked. The art then becomes, how do we make sense of that data? 
And I have this, you know, this experience over and over again, where, you know, a group of us are looking at a dashboard and it's, let's say it's got 16 pictures and we can all walk away with a very different interpretation of how well we're doing and what we need to focus on, right? Because maybe I'm looking at this one particular graph and it's going up into the right. And I'm like, guys, let's pat ourselves on the back. We're doing really well. And you're looking at this other thing. You're looking maybe at a particular segment and you're saying, oh no, our product's not doing well in India. What should we do? And you know, we can be really misaligned about what the story of the data is, which then doesn't help us be able to get on the same page about what we should prioritize and what we should do about it. And so being able to think of data, not as, you know, a pure science, but in, in, instead an art form, right? There's an element of just, of course, tracking the data, but then there's an art to interpreting it and drawing the most important narrative of it from it, and then being able to align the team around it. That is an art form. And once you have that alignment of data, then the thing to do is actually treat it with design because what design does is takes opportunities and then envisions solutions to those opportunities, right? And I think of design as well in very broad terms. I don't think of design as just what designers do. I think of uh, design as anything in which we're in the solution mode of envisioning, okay, here's a problem, here's an opportunity, what should we do about it? Um, and that similarly is not a science. The data cannot tell us what to design. We look at the data, it helps inform our view of the world. We interpret it, we try and do that in a great way, which highlights the opportunities, and then we end up treating with design. Another example to just illustrate this is, is if I said, hey guys, we grew 20% year over year. You know, should we be happy? Should we not be? I think, you know, if you were, uh, if I asked you this question, you'd probably tell me, well, it depends. Like 20% doesn't mean anything without context, right? We have to understand, well, if we're growing 20%, maybe what did we grow the year before? If we grew 80% the year before and now we're growing 20%, maybe we shouldn't be happy with that. You might also ask, what's our market growing at, right? If our market is growing at 10% and we're growing 20%, perhaps we should be quite happy. You know, every single metric that you look at is in the context of something, right? It, it, you know, and, and to understand the context, to be able to draw the conclusion is what I mean when I talk about data fluency. So in order to really focus on your data fluency, a couple of things need to happen. The first is that you need to ask the right questions, you know, and, and, um, and that means when you're thinking about what we should focus on next, you know, do you know what the problems are? Are you aware of, you know, uh, uh, where you're doing well and where you're not doing well? Do you have a sense of which customer segments are, you know, most successful versus least successful? The second thing is, you know, again, if someone gives you a data interpretation and says, this is good, this is bad, make sure you understand the context. Ask questions about that, you know, uh, know what is this good or bad in relation to, you know, are we comparing against ourselves in the past? Are we comparing against different segments? Are we comparing against the, the market? Because all of those matter. And finally, be a key active contributor in defining how we're measuring good. Just because something goes up doesn't mean it's good. You know, you need better benchmarks to really help you define both what, what's possible, but what should be your, your what's a realistic and yet uh, aspirational target for, for, for setting and hitting goals. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about a good process, um, the, the final piece. I think about process as designing how you consistently design great things. Meaning, you know, if you are excellent at coming up with the answer and, you know, you're the person who's kind of masterminding everything, that's cool. But I wouldn't say that you necessarily, you maybe have a great personal process, but you don't have a process in which that's necessarily repeatable, right? Because what if, you know, you weren't able to do all of this stuff? Like, will the team be able to repeatedly hit their goals, repeatedly come up with, you know, great solutions to problems, repeatedly even be able to identify what the right problems are. And as a product leader, part of your job is almost to almost like, you know, play the metagame, right? So not just for this particular problem, let's find the right solution, but to go one step above and say, how do we consistently have the right ingredients in the right environment such that we can always find the best solution, you know, time after time. And you know, there'll always be some things, you know, in the course of your career uh, in product management or, or building things that, you know, some things will go well and some things won't, right? You'll, you'll, you won't always uh, have find success. But what's important is that if you don't find success, 
learning from those mistakes so that you know you're never making the same mistake twice and similarly if something is going well for you extracting the lessons so that you can figure out how can we do more of that in the future and be able to you know again repeatedly come to you know the 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 great outcome that we had this time around in the next problem even if the next problem looks completely different and so you have to think about this in the long game one way that I, I like to compare this to is, is in the game of poker, right? If you think about, you know, how you win each hand, a lot of it is going to depend on luck. You know, if you have pocket aces, you have a much higher likelihood of winning that round, of winning that hand, than if you have, you know, like a, like a two and a seven or something along those lines. And yet, if you look at, you know, the history of people who are great, there are such things as great poker players, you know, people who repeatedly win the World Series of Poker. And so there's an element where, yes, some hands they have bad and some hands they have good, but they have this skill to be able to know how to call the shots such that over the long run of playing, you know, thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of hands of poker, they more often win than not. And I think that's a great analogy for us because we do need to keep in mind that certain things are beyond our control. Market conditions, you know, the the luck of, of what happens, you know, the, the the hands that we were, the cards that we were dealt, um, it's not always gonna be something that, that we can make into a win. But if you are good and if you focus on process and you focus on having the right ingredients, you will win many more hands throughout the course of your career. And that is something, um, you know, to, uh, to, to take away um, that it is a long game and that, you know, I hope that you all have a long and fruitful career. Uh, and it isn't just about what happens in this one particular launch or not. Um, it's about what you're learning to take away uh, for, for the rest of your career. Um, the other, some of these ingredients for what does it mean for, for us to, you know, create great ingredients within a team include things like, you know, is there micromanagement? Are we having over constrained requirements? Are people feeling anxious? Are there too many meetings? These are all the things that might get in the way of a team being able to operate at their best. Similarly, these are some of the things that can help people do their best work, right? A sense of safety, being able to recognize, you know, who's doing great work, having an inspiring environment, getting enough sleep, you know, having creativity and, and, and sessions for, for feedback. These are all of the things that over time help us, you know, as a group of people be able to deliver or, or give us the best chance of being able to deliver the best work. So in conclusion, I want to go back to what I thought would make me a great leader was having a great product vision. Of course, that's important, uh, but there's actually many more things I would say that are as or more important, including, of course, having a great process, being fluent about um, understanding how to, uh, how to both ask for the right questions and interpret data in the best way, being a skilled translator among the different functions that come together to make a product successful. And finally, most importantly, owning and executing against the goals. Thanks a lot for, for listening. Um, and I hope this helps you uh, in your journey ahead. Thank you so much, Julie, for taking the time to share your knowledge with us today. Success often doesn't look like what we think it is. And your, what you talked about today really helps us understand that. I would also like to thank our global audience who have tuned in from around the world. Folks, please take the opportunity to give Julie a big virtual round of applause. We'll be back for additional talks, so don't go anywhere. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, Julie, for your talk. Thank you.